Thank you. Um, as you all received, um, this past last week is an update to uh, staffing at the district level. Uh, this position is the Executive Director of Careers Technology and Innovation. Uh, this is a three-year position uh, at the same level as the Executive Director of Community Education, which um, you approved a few weeks ago. Uh, this position is to take on some of those roles as our former um, uh, principal on special assignment to move forward the Pathways to Success program, but really expand that program to a, a VPK or K-12 uh, and uh, age 21 programming that we really uh, implement a, um, as you saw, an adult, uh, a, a pre-K to adult pathway for students so that each student is supported academically and socially. Um, I don't know if the superintendent would like to speak to this. Chair, directors, and community, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, as we uh, look to support our mission and vision and, and really expand opportunities for pre-K to adult opportunity, uh, this is an essential position to uh, really ensure that we support each student as they continue to think about their journey and beyond, uh, not only in their experience in Albert Lee schools, but also in post-secondary or any type of opportunities after high school. You know, when we think about the career in tech and innovation, it's really did important for us to uh, really uh, focus down on our students' opportunities in an innovative way versus the remediation. Really providing our students that those experiential learning opportunities in this position links our pathways and really links back to our, our mission as well as our goal set for So this is essential to continue the work to enhance what we're doing and provide more opportunities and bring coherence to um, our strategic uh, visioning moving forward. Okay, uh, we have uh, been introduced to this at, at previous meeting, and you've all had uh, you've all had an opportunity to examine the uh, the actual uh, uh, contract agreement. Um, I would entertain a motion uh, regarding this this uh, item, and then we can discuss it. So moved. moved by Bruce to approve. Seconded by Kim. Now, uh, any further questions, discussions? Gil? Yes. Um, so this is a new administrative position. Is it replacing another one or just an additional administrator? Yeah, well, as we, um, thank you, great question. As we look to realign um, at the district level, we did close a post of position, principal and special assignment and redefined in through a strategic and coherent lens to align to our mission. So it is a new position as we close another one. So it's a cost neutral position, just more realignment to our coherence and our mission. Thank you. And how do you envision pathways um, synthesizing with pre-K and K students? So when we look to enhance the opportunities, our pathways to success, and when we look pre-K to um, 12th grade, we need to look beyond, and it's that birth to adult. So really thinking about the career in tech, but also the innovation. And, and one example would be the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for our students, and, and bridging that with the possibilities of, of Riverland and others, and to really enhancing that. And I know that even our afternoon or our uh, Tiger uh, Tales, what we call it, our targeted services, and our summer school opportunities, really thinking it's not about the remediation, the new uh, literacy uh, or literature out there, as well as research shows that it's more about the innovation, providing those students the extensions and meeting them where they are and extending their thinking. So this would then enhance the opportunities at the elementary and bridging into high school and beyond. Okay, and, and uh, uh, a kind of a, a, per, a different way of looking at that, as I see this, the whole event has been precipitated by the retirement of Chris Chalmers at Community Ed. So he was replaced by John Double, uh, whose position has now been revised somewhat and adjusted uh, to accommodate the, the needs that we see in terms of 
of uh, vocational training and career exploration pathways to success. So this position is going to embody what John was doing. So we, ha we have the same number of people. I like the term pathways, by the way. That's a term that we, uh, at the Education uh, Foundation, and we, in fact, we just had a very uh, well-attended reception a couple weeks ago. And for us, pathways to success is pretty parallel to what uh, it, what it means here too. We have uh, we have students that take the path, and we have uh, uh, educational staff, teachers, mostly administrators, who point the direction to the path. So it's very uh, it's, can, it's a very popular phase of education these days, and it should be career training, vocational training, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Kim can appreciate this too because part of this part of this position will involve coordination further coordination with with our community college uh, so we will be a, a essentially a k-14 or the opportunity will be there for a k a well coordinated k-14 program pre-k-14 program all right It really is a promotion of community, um, uh, a community approach to education, and so I think that commitment is seen in other districts. And it's it's nice that it's we're not like tagging other things to it. It's its position, and um, other districts have been very successful in in starting this work. So I'm excited to see where this goes. And and I think um, I, I'm a I was in little ed, and now I'm in higher ed. So I really like that transition of including those, those, the littles. All right, we are are voting on the master agreement, which we have had an opportunity to examine. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we accept that agreement. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, six zero. Thank you. Now, into the study session, um, the I only item, um, actually we're still in the, <laughs> we're not there yet, uh, for two superintendent performance expectation. Uh, we um, have talked about this quite a bit. We had a, uh, we had a uh, uh, workshop with Bob Dorn and MSBA uh, giving us some background and some uh, suggestions uh, relative to the, the uh, per, uh, evaluation of the superintendent. And uh, you should have, all, all of you, uh, a result of the polling that, was, that took place where each of us uh, selected a standard, or two standards that we thought were most important, and then uh, each of those standards had a, a quite a number of elements, and we chose uh, the two elements that we considered most uh, important for each of those standards. And you have the results uh, in front of you, and the results indicated that the third standard, communication and community relationship, was uh, the second most uh, important category uh, uh, according to us and the, the, the number one, uh, the, the category that got the most uh, votes was student support. So those are the two areas that we will be uh, examining. And so then um, Ashley uh, tallied up the results of our input uh, regarding the elements for those two standards, and the first one had a, a, a tie for the second most important element, so we will examine three elements there for communi uh, communication and community relationships, and you can see from the tally in front of you that that involves engagement, informs the community as a whole, and visibility and approachability. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be evaluating the superintendent uh, on those three elements for that standard. And then uh, for the um, 
the uh, second one, student support, uh, there was no, no uh, although there was a tie, but it was for, for first place. So we will examine support for students and school safety and security. Um, that's, uh, that was the approach that we agreed to take to choose the standards and the elements for which our superintendent will be evaluated by us. And uh, what that boils down to is also, you also have in front of you, uh, and this is a draft, as the title suggests, first draft, uh, which Ashley put together. And it uh, is also consistent with what uh, we discussed uh, at the session with Barb Dorn. And um, it consists of two, uh, two sections. One is uh, pretty uh, objective, uh, where there are four responses for each of the elements under those standards that, that were selected. And uh, we would uh, simply uh, select or choose what we consider to be the appropriate response for the superintendent's performance in all of those areas. And that those results uh, will be tallied by Ashley. And, and I'm, and, uh, I'm thinking that uh, we will probably do that electronically so that the results can be tabulated electronically so we don't have to, uh, Ashley doesn't have to physically um, uh, tabulate that and, and uh, add up the results. Um, and then the second part is uh, a subjective uh, evaluation where each of us will have an opportunity to, to uh, submit uh, in writing uh, our uh, opinion of the extent to which our superintendent has performed in all of those areas. Now, uh, the task that we have in front of us tonight is to uh, agree on this draft or suggest improvements if, if you can, if you uh, would prefer a different, a different uh, instrument to measure those areas which we selected. So that's uh, an action item. Um, I think it might be appropriate to uh, move uh, to uh, approve this, and then we can discuss it and uh, make amendments or changes. How would you like to proceed? You want to, dis uh, we, you want to discuss this and then... Uh, make possible adjustments and... It would appear we, we would need some action to start. Yeah. I'll move approval. Okay, that was, uh, that's, that was kind of my opinion too. It's been moved that we approve this document. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Bruce. Uh, it has been moved and seconded that we accept the uh, measurement instrument as presented before you. Now, uh, discussion. Just one uh, quick comment. So it changed from when we discussed with Barb Dorn then our top two uh, uh, elements or standards then, correct? Well, yeah, but the only change was a result of a tie in those elements. So we'll have three. Right, so finance still stays in there. That's a two though, is that right? Because uh, that was with Barb, that was a, a three and so was student support. And then the uh, tie was teaching and learning and community relations what I had tabbed anyway. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, th we, I think the agreement was that we would each pick uh, two standards. Right. And uh, the two that received the most uh, picks or right. selections would be the ones that we would. Right, and I just said that was different from when we discussed with Barb that night. We had two different, we had one different, but we had standards change within there from when we all decided to, uh, to do our individual votes. Not that it matters, I'm just saying that it's different, but the same instrument, it's correct. And not all members were at the meeting, so of That's course right. we wouldn't want to exclude those members. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? Kim? So with the motion, we're voting to approve these specific elements that, because they were the, mm -hmm. the yep. highest ranked? Okay. Exactly as it appears on, on this uh, second document. 
Um, for for me, um, I I'm I'm good with this because it's a good starting spot. But I my thought process is so much of these um, standards can't happen if we don't have good school district finance. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm I, I'm struggling a little bit with that because both of these I would say are. Um, complementary community and community relations our uh, communication and community relations and student support are complementary work to the work we do um, and so that concerns me a little bit um, but I am definitely on board with the majority and yeah. having everybody have a voice but I just wanted to make sure that I voiced that because I think one of our, our big responsibilities is being fiduciarily responsible for the the, the the funds that come to our district and a lot of these things if we're going to um, evaluate our superintendent or give supports to our superintendent may lock us a little bit on on the work he's doing. So I just wanted to voice that concern. Yeah, and I guess my vision is that we will do this twice a year. So I, I'm, I would assume that if we chose two standards this time, we would choose two different standards the next time and, and we could consider depending on what the board uh, returns, perhaps most likely finances would be run. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I just want to um, reaffirm that all eight standards are absolutely important, and neither one is more important than the other because they are essential and they're inter, uh, interlocked and they, they kind of dependent on each other. So all will be focused on, but when you really want to evaluate and what are the, and yes, uh, Director Clout, that finance was one as we looked uh, across, but know that all of them will be important and feedback is absolutely accepted through all, but the evaluation will be on, on these elements, but we'll continue to monitor all the different standards as they're very important uh, for the uh, success of our students. Thank you. Angie. I think this is still on. Uh, I actually had changed my vote slightly since our last meeting, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with this. My top two priorities have been, um, you know, recovering the learning loss and then dealing with some of the behavioral issues, and I think this, this does touch on those areas. So, um, And the finances are very important, too, but in my opinion, I feel like we are in a good spot with that, and these are some areas where we, we need some more focus. So... Um, and at this time, we're at a good spot with finances. We continue to uh, add some expenses, and we have any uh, big changes in the near future. Finances start to drop. I've seen other districts happen to add 12, 14 percent uh, general fund balances and go down to three or four percent, and now they're going to the voters to operate and to try to maintain and, and uh, help this learning loss. So that's what I want to make sure that we continue to fiduciarily wa watch our finances. And I would also be of the, of the um, position that our finances are in a good place, and I don't, they're always at the forefront of our discussion, so I don't foresee any problems there coming up. I'm comfortable with the two standards um, chosen, I, and I was going to ask when the evaluation period would be, so you're thinking twice a year, which I think is what MSBA had recommended. And we might want to ask them, I just don't know if, if we choose four new things every six months, that seems like it's kind of a, a quick turnaround. And I don't know if some of these standards or some of the elements need a little bit more time um, in place to get them rolling. So I guess that would be my one thought, um, maybe to get some guidance from MSBA if we were to choose four new ones or if we would keep a couple and switch a couple out at that point. Yeah, Chair Scooter, the, the um, MSBA recommended that these will continue throughout the, the year. So we'll do a mid-year, then an end of the year. And then at the end of the year, then we look to redefine future elements as necessary. 
Thank you. And then my only other point would be if we're going with five instead of four, we probably want to change the wording to five elements. And then I was um, unsure, what are the to be determined, the summative sample form, the to be determined, what are those last two, two or three pages about? Now the study session. Uh, district goals ensure high quality core instruction focusing on tier one of multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, we have a report from Hawthorne, Mr. Mahal. All right, good evening everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've spent the day uh, so far doing uh, parent-teacher conferences, so we've had lots of people in the building today and uh, last week as well, so it's been very, uh, lots of fun to see everyone back in the building and having those connections. So I uh, look forward though to going through the, with all of this with you guys. So you can see uh, our uh, building picture uh, that we do each year. Uh, that first B isn't quite the B that we would like, <laughs> but it's close. You kind of get the idea of the theme what we're going for this year in terms of being kind. Uh, so the format of the presentation is very similar to what you've seen with the other elementaries at this point. Um, so this first one is a, an opportunity to kind of see some of our students. Uh, bottom left is one of our kindergarten classes. Uh, far right is our uh, student council, uh, which I love the diversity of our students that we have there. Uh, and then the middle ones are students working on with some of our science uh, curriculum, I think, I believe in a third grade classroom. So again, just... <coughs> Good representation of our students there. Uh, now to what's challenging to see, but I'll try to explain it a little bit. Uh, so you can see uh, our student demogra demographics. I tried to go back in the last two or three years as well to find that information for uh, everyone, but uh, the state is having, uh, with COVID, doesn't have a lot of data to go back to. Um, but you can see our current uh, EL population is at 17%. Uh, special education, uh, or I'm sorry, this was for last year. Um, our special education was around 21%. Excuse me just a minute. Is your mic on? I'm just wondering because our camera is still. Yep, it's Okay, it is. Spread. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, our free reduced population last year was uh, 62%, and I believe that is... Um, up even more so uh, by a couple percent this year, uh, but that was our uh, demographics last year. Our staff demographics, um, you can see we have 35 overall licensed staff, 23 uh, support staff, which is different paras, uh, educational assistants, office staff, custodial staff, uh, two success coaches uh, that are wonderful and uh, we have one math corps person that has just begun with us uh, within the last couple weeks. Um, so we're looking forward to having uh, her helping and supporting our uh, fourth and fifth grade students as well. <clears throat> basically what you can see here is the attendance piece. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were basically at 95% uh, present. And from there you can kind of see the differences in 94, 91 and last year at 92%. So overall pretty solid considering um, Again, the pandemic and being in person, not in person. Uh, so I'm, I expect that number to creep back up to that mid-90 area um, just now that we are fully back in person and people uh, really are kind of back in the swing of uh, what normal, quote-unquote normal is there. The next few slides are going to be about our student proficiency with uh, MCA. Uh, scores and uh, also within our FAST scores as well. So the first one on the left-hand side is our reading achievement. 
uh, uh, I don't know how this happened, but somehow, some way, our MCA scores finished exactly the same in reading and math. Um, so we finished, our achievement rate with reading was 37.4%. Uh, you can see the district average uh, here is 34.1, state average 48.6. Um, but what we really have been focused on as a building, uh, especially the last couple of years, is uh, what's our overall progress and, and what's our, our student growth. And you can see over on the right the progress there. Um, our students uh, in that dark blue, uh, basically uh, that's 35% where our student level improved and 30% um, where they maintained and then 35% where it was, there was a, a decrease or did not meet. And you can see the differences. You know, within the district, it was 19% um, had improved and 34% maintained, and state averages were 20% uh, improved and 43% maintained. So we did a really nice job as a building, um, generally speaking, with our uh, maintaining or growing within our reading. Math, uh, again, 37.4% for our overall achievement rate. Uh, the average for the district is 30.3, and statewide is 41.7%. Um, again, our growth rate, uh, we have 23% that improved, 30% that maintained, with 47% uh, decreasing or, or not meeting. Uh, district averages were 20% improved, 32% maintained, 48% decreased or did not meet. And then state averages are 18, 42, and 40%. This gives you an idea of what it looked, uh, what our math, reading, and science has looked like over time. The next two slides anyways are that way. So you can kind of see uh, prior to the pandemic, and now a little bit afterwards, and I can speak to what we're working on afterwards uh, here. Um, but after the pandemic, you know, in 2021, for math, kind of dipped down to 28.6, and, and then now last year, 39.2. Uh, reading, again, we went up 3%, and science, we went up around, what's that? I don't know, 14% there. So. Uh, again, I feel like we're on the right track with what we're doing. And again, I'll explain more about that here as we move forward. But you can see the, uh, again, the last five years piece of data there. And this is just another uh, trend data that we kind of looked at. You can see kind of the uh, the fun uh, little molecule there in 2020, uh, since there was no testing during that time anyways. Uh, and again, just uh, this was our proficiency for our students um, and just how, again, um, amazingly worked out at 39.2%. And I, we tried to do the math a couple different times, and it kept coming out that way. So, um, but again, we're trending the right direction in terms of where we want to go uh, with and for our students. This is our FAST data. So our students uh, are, have this assessment at the beginning of school. Um, here in December, we'll uh, do our winter assessments and then again in the spring so we can really try to see what the growth uh, is looking like. And, and what you can see there is in the uh, purple or above the line basically, those are our students that are in low risk uh, areas compared to the pink and, and or the red that are in the sum or high risk. So again, math last year, the low risk was in that 45% for both. And then on the right-hand side, you have the reading, which, again, 45% low risk. Um, I guess my, the conversations we have had as a building uh, as, as we looked at this was uh, much of what we were working on doing during the pandemic was trying to do our best to maintain, uh, build, and keep those relationships uh, strong. Uh, and, and fill as many holes as possible because we knew with students kind of uh, just in the educational setting that we had, it was going to be challenging to uh, really grow quite a bit. Um, and so 
as we look at this data, we, we really believe that we did a nice job of being able to maintain even through all of the, uh, uh, you know, issues that were presented our way. All right, savers. So this is kind of a new or newer one for us. This is uh, our social emotional uh, piece of um, FAST. And you can see last year, and I did put in the fall of this year just so you can have a comparison, because last year was the first time that we, we really filled this out and, and tried to better understand where our needs are of our students socially and emotionally. But in the low risk areas of tier one last year in the fall, and this is from our staff rating, 79% um, of our, st our students were in that green or tier one or just needing classroom uh, pieces, you know, the regular uh, curriculum. 18% were in the tier two and 3% were in the tier three or the most need. The winter, you can see it kind of trending the right way in terms of 81% being low risk. And then the spring being 83% low risk. Um, so again, uh, with all the, the work we were doing within our second step curriculum, our counselor, uh, social worker, uh, really put in a lot of great work there. And, and of course our classroom teachers uh, supporting them in the tier one pieces. Uh, it was nice to see. You can see now in the fall of this year, uh, our staff also uh, came back and we did have redone the uh, survey and 78% are in the low risk, 18 some and 4% high risk. And uh, so we're really working hard at meeting those current needs right now. Celebrations. Um, <clears throat> So what I have down here is we have, we've had growth across all grade levels in five out of the six uh, MCA assessments. So, you know, again, grades three, four, and five, they have both a math and, and reading assessment. And we had growth from out of five out of the six. And we really attribute that to the unit planning and the cycle work that each of the grade levels are participating in. Uh, and they also really started to dabble uh, within the proficiency scales and, and what what and how does that work uh, for the grade level, for the students, for our parents as well, just in communicating that information. Uh, we began uh, diving into our benchmark writing again. Uh, we saw that as a building need uh, a couple years ago, and we started to do some work around that. And so you can see uh, we've, we have specific time within our master schedule to come back and really teach writing because we think and we believe that if you are a proficient writer, you're going to be hopefully a proficient reader. Um, and with that, uh, through the trainings and conversations we've had, uh, there's a renewed energy from students and staff to write for multiple purposes. So we're really excited where this can go for our building. Science, uh, we have Amplify Science now. There's a specific time within the master schedule for that to happen, uh, and same thing. Uh, that hands-on work has just been tremendous. And now in year two this year, you can really see uh, the teachers diving into it even further because they, they, they have some experience with uh, that now kind of second year within the curriculum. Uh, last year, uh, you heard about this from Halverson in terms of uh, what they were doing with their MTSS process. Um, we were working on going that way uh, this year. Um, and last year, uh, once we came back from winter break, uh, we decided to, we're just, we're going to go in, we're going to make it happen now, we're going to work through some of the bumps, and, uh, could we see that this is the best practice for our students? Um, and so we, we worked through that last year. Uh, our resource specialist, uh, has been fantastic in helping lead that charge. Uh, the data analysis that we now have through this process, uh, is absolutely amazing within our meetings. Uh, it's a very fluid model, and, and the bottom part there, it supports every student, not just some. This process truly does uh, support um, every student, and, and that's what I heard what you guys talking about here at the beginning of the meeting in terms of supporting learning loss. This process does that, and we're really excited to see where that can go. Uh, and then I also wanted to celebrate high reliability schools within our building. We have 
We had 100% certified staff participating in our instructional rounds. We're the only building that can say that that happened. We're very proud of that. And uh, we had every certified staff choose a Marzano element for their IGP and lesson study pieces. So again, we got a lot out of uh, our instructional coach, really did a fantastic job in helping lead that charge. Uh, over on the right-hand side, you can see Tier 1. Uh, we started moving away from it being just social worker that's doing a lot of the Tier 1 to now uh, it's classroom teachers being uh, more in charge of in uh, working with our uh, school counselor within the, the Tier 1 pieces. Um, and then now that frees up our social, or I'm sorry, our school counselor to help out with our Tier 2 um, with between whole class interventions, small group, individual. Um, that's been a really nice uh, support for our students uh, currently. Uh, as you saw earlier, consistent attendance. Uh, our partnerships with parents is very strong. Um, I'm really proud of that. And again, the transportation supports were, uh, were very solid as well. I'm very pleased with that. So again, all in all, um, there's always room for improvement. I know I take the data very personal in terms of where we're at. Uh, so I know that there's room to grow there. But despite the pandemic, we really believe we continue to grow um, as a building, as professionals, and in supporting our students uh, with their needs. Um, last one for you, opportunities for growth. Um, we still see, I mean, again, we continue to try to grow uh, obviously every day, every year. Um, but that staff development continues to be extremely important. And these are our three building uh, goals in terms of what we want to do within the Marzano elements. We believe that we're going to do some staff development around this and really get strong in chunking content, processing content, and recording and representing content. Um, Social-emotional learning, like I said, we've made adjustments there to increase more of the Tier 1 uh, supports and hopefully decrease as much of the Tier 3 as possible. And uh, again, increase the capacity within our reading and math win. Um, you know, the grade level discussions, the building discussions, um, and then that final one I wanted to bring up, and I know this was uh, discussions about last year, but recently I've talked with uh, the University of Minnesota and, and Cary, and we're likely going to try to partner with them to so they can help us with a MTSS program evaluation now that we have that up and running so that they can help us understand are we on track, uh, are we missing anything, uh, you know, just that fidelity piece uh, to make sure that we're uh, doing what we need to do there. So, um, again, all in all, with the intentional work that we are and we have implemented, uh, again, with our master schedule, wind time, the cycle work, uh, the writing, PLC, uh, we really think that, again, we have the right systems in place, which is why we're able to be uh, recognized as a school of excellence uh, to help every student be successful and hopefully make great gains. So with that, any questions? Sure. Um, could you go back to some of the graphs that you had of how your school has done over the past um, Tell me where you'd like me to stop. Uh, right there. Yep. So do you have any that are, have the district and state superimposed, or could you give us a, kind of a synopsis of what you would think that look like? With where we are yeah. currently? Uh, from my understanding and from what I've seen, I don't have it superimposed here. Um, we are right at where the state is, um, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, we might be a point or two above in terms of math and or reading, but we're not far off, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We would definitely mm -hmm. like to be higher, uh, and that's part of the plan. Thank you. And then to the Sabre slide. Yes, ma'am. Please. I noticed that last year they incrementally got a little bit um, greener through the year. Mm -hmm. Is that what you would expect during a school year for the numbers to improve just a little bit? That's the hope. With, uh, with our counselor and teachers now doing a lot of the Tier 1 pieces in the classroom, mm -hmm. and then her, our counselor, being able to meet more specifically and directly with more small groups, more individual students. I think we're going to be able to give students more attention, uh, and not just students, but also families, mm -hmm. because we have found that we have a lot of families that also uh, are struggling and have needs that um, 
they need, we can't necessarily address them, but we can point them in the right direction in terms of how to help support them and their mm -hmm. needs. Um, so yes, I would expect to see that also uh, in increase as well. Thank you. And then lastly, um, when you dream your principal dreams and you think, if, if, if I could just have one, this one thing in the school, this would really make a difference. If you think of, it could be something tangible or intangible, it could be maybe on the fringes of reality, but speaking generally about that, can you think of anything that, that you dream about when you think of things that could really help the student? It's a great question. You know, having the opportunity to go through, you know, with this being my fifth year here, I've definitely had the opportunity to grow uh, as an administrator and learn from a lot of different people and situations. Um, I really believe firmly that uh, the multi-tier systems of support program that we are working to put in and implement, I think has a, a chance, and I, again, you saw the, uh, the data from Halverson and, and what that was able to help do with, with their students. I can't promise you that it's going to do the same with us because we're a different subset of, of students and, and whatnot. But I believe in this process. I, I've seen it work, you know, in, in collaboration with other, um, uh, again, with the University of Minnesota. And I guess I would say this too. Um, in talking with a lot of my elementary colleagues across the state, they're trying to search on how do you start to implement MTSS within, within a building, within a district. And I'm excited to be able to talk with them about that because, again, we don't have a down pat. We're not perfect by any means, but we have a process that we think is going to work. And a lot of colleagues are definitely like, I don't know where to start because it's such a big uh, ordeal or, or, or overtaking. So um, when I dream big, that's, I would love to see this process really support our staff the way that uh, – they're capable of and doing great things to help every student within the building. I just want to say congratulations on increasing double digits in science and math over Thank 21. You. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, congratulations on School of Excellence to you and your staff. Amazing work. Uh, we'll get you the state data, but just it was 44% math, 51% reading. We'll overlay that with, with Albert Thank Lee. You. But the one piece that I want to reinforce the multi-tiered systems of support, and when we look at the interrupted learning, we have a lot of work to do. When we have 40% on average of students that are proficient, that's 60% that are not. So when we think of multi-tiered systems of support, it is every student, each student. And what does that uh, individual plan for each student look like? We did do a learning walk with uh, the elementary administrators as well as Mary Jo and the executive director of teaching and learning to look at the strategies um, in, in the implementation at Hawthorne. And we saw some amazing work. We saw the small group opportunities. We saw individual skill reinforcement. We saw amazing work with each student. And we also saw a teacher that was monitoring the flexible grouping and the re reading interventions, as well as providing support in mathematics. So it is happening. We've witnessed that. That's an expectation. So we will continue to uh, monitor the growth of Hawthorne, and we'll have a report as we look at the FAST data in the winter to celebrate the growth of, of each student at Hawthorne. We're definitely looking forward anxiously to the data that will be coming out here in a month or so, so yeah, absolutely. So, your intentional work has really shown, John. That's been, you know, the, as you said, just coming back from the uh, pandemic, uh, it was it was great to see the um, the numbers the, uh, of kids that are in school. I was thinking that was going to be a lot lower, but I think the intentionalism has really helped a lot with these kids now with the, the expectations of making the expectations maybe more realizable for them to do. So keep that up. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Southwest. Tyler. Thank you, 
you turned it off on me. Uh, second year as the principal at Southwest Middle School. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, at any point, if you guys have questions um, on any of the data that I'm showing, feel free to interrupt me and stop me and um, ask that as well. So uh, first things first, I wanted just to kind of share with you guys. Oh, I got to click it on there. There we go. Uh, so if you ever stop into Southwest and notice, uh, we have posters along um, around the school that focus on our four core values of integrity, respect, compassion, and collaboration. So we do talk a lot about the mission statement at Albert Lee Schools, but uh, you know the one thing that we talk with our students about is one way to achieve that mission is by exhibiting these four core values. So um, we spend time at the beginning of the year talking about what each one of these values means. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, but our student council then, um, I'm going to have them kind of update our posters as we have new students from year to year as well. All right, so our student demographics, uh, both images here show the same things. One's just the pie chart, the other one is the table. So just under 500 students uh, at Southwest, uh, the right side of the table kind of breaks it down as far as the counts go as well, but very similar to what um, our district numbers are. And then when we take a closer look here as well, so our uh, EL population, or English language learners, uh, we have 48, or just under 10% of our students. Our special education, we have about 84 students, which is just about 17%. Uh, and free and reduced for right around 50% as well. Staff demographics. Uh, so we have 43 teachers. This includes our resource specialists, our uh, social worker, counselor, um, dean of students. So 43 teachers, uh, 10 paraprofessionals, seven other staff, so that's office staff, our health clerk, um, hall monitors, things like that, and then um, me as the administrator. All right, a lot of information here. So um, what you're looking at here is the attendance at Southwest this year. It's period attendance. So a typical um, Southwest student would have eight periods throughout the day. Uh, and so this is showing that um, data. So uh, the first column is August, second column September, third column is October. So as you can see, we'll just take August, for example. We had uh, 244 total tardies in August. Uh, to kind of put it in perspective, the third from the bottom row, it kind of gives you an idea of how many periods there were. So to figure that out, it's basically how many students there are, which is, I'll just say 500 to make it easy math, times eight periods in a day, times however many days there were in the month. So um, in the month of August, for example, there was 44,704 periods. Uh, and so out of those 244 tardies, the unexcused absences, uh, for the month of August, you can see it's 649. Excused absences, 2,642. Uh, and then the COVID-related absences. And so the bottom two rows, just to kind of show you, I know John just showed the um, percent, the flip-flopped of that, so like 92% um, attendance rate. Uh, this is just the opposite. So in the month of August, for example, uh, excluding COVID, uh, we had 7.36% of the 44,704 absences missed. So we had about 92% attendance in the month of August. So any questions with this data? I have There's some a questions. Lot. Yes. So on the total unexcused absences, so I know this is by period then, what are, where are you experiencing most of your unexcused absences and why has it been jumping, especially in October? Yeah, good question. Uh, so generally speaking, the unexcused absences, uh, at Southwest, um, it's usually a full day where maybe the parent or guardian didn't call in for whatever reason, and so they, they are marked as unexcused. Um, we very rarely see like a student like skipping classes, for example. Um, we don't see that. I mean, we do see it sometimes, but it's less than 10, I would say, I mean, in periods throughout the year. Um, so a lot of those are just lack of phone calls um, from parents or guardians. And you have how many hours in your day? Uh, there's eight class periods. So that's over 100 days? Correct. Missed. So what happens? What's the follow-up with these kids, students, 
who have these over 100 days of unexcused absences? Yeah, good, good question. So our Dean of Students, Ms. Larson, um, deals with the attendance and discipline. And so um, by law, when a student misses three, and really it's three class periods on three different days, so even if they miss one class period unexcused when they get to that secondary level, it's considered one unexcused absence day. So um, when a student gets the three of those, whether they miss one period on three different days or miss the whole day, um, they're considered to be continually truant. And so at that time, our Dean of Students meets with the student. Um, we print off a form. She kind of goes through, you know, kind of what happens if a student continues to miss. Uh, and then they sign off on it and it gets mailed home as well. When it gets to seven days, that student is considered to be habitually truant. And then at that time, um, that student is referred to Jacob Stockwell as our truancy officer at Southwest Middle School, um, and where he intervenes and kind of steps in at that point as well. I guess it just strikes me because we just saw um, an elementary um, put up their number, and I think it was 0.03% unexcused so I'm just I, I'm just wondering where's the disconnect here is it with families you know what it's just such a drastic um, contradiction yeah I agree and I, I think that's one of the um, issues coming out of the pandemic too is that there seems to be and not just Albert Lee but a lax of that attendance piece where before COVID it was it's the expectation that you go to school which again it's the law um, but uh, for whatever reason, coming back, um, that, it's, that priority needs to be reset as well. So, um, and as you're going to see here in the next slide, too, I have some data from Southwest last, as of last year anyways. Yeah, so this is uh, data from last year. So now what we're looking at here is kind of a, a little bit different data. So this is individual students. And I know I've talked to the board a couple years ago about uh, chronically absenteeism. Uh, and so when you look at any district, uh, most districts are going to say when a student's chronically absent is when they miss 10% or more of the school year. Whether it's excused or unexcused, it doesn't matter. And so um, research and data shows that when a student gets to that 10% or more, uh, their academics suffer, which again, makes sense. Uh, but here is Southwest um, data from last year. And so uh, you can see that first column is the percent of days missed. To the right there shows you just kind of that range of days. And then the number of students in that middle column. And so uh, the last two columns there just shows the average fails for semester one and the average number of fails for semester two. So again, um, this is data that uh, at the beginning of the school year, uh, when parents were coming in and doing the Alpine House, uh, we had four different presentations throughout that day for parents to come learn more about Southwest. And we talked about this attendance piece and again, want to make it personal so that way it's not like, oh, across the country, here's what's going on, but really here's what we're seeing with our student population being at school, not only is lawful, but also very important for their learning. Question. Yeah. So um, the average fails then, um, that's how many classes per semester they are failed? Yes, yep, and another great question too. So typically on average a student will take seven classes that have a grade. Um, some of our special ed students or some of our students that get pulled out for uh, intervention might have six classes, um, but for the most part all students will have seven classes per semester. Thank you. And then how, um, how when a student is on out of school suspension, and I wanted to uh, thank Superintendent Wagner for <laughs> capturing my question at our last meeting and now putting those in our updates. So we do have some of the, I asked about suspensions, and so I do have some of that data. And um, a question on that data, maybe for later, is um, I don't know what period of time is that for this year, um, what's the period of time. But anyway, if someone is on out of school suspension, are they counted, um, they're absent then? They are, but it's considered to be excused absence, so it's not an unexcused absence. So if we went back to that first slide, it would be, if we look at October, for example, it would be one of those 5,687 absences. And what kind of educational support do they get when they're out on out-of-school suspension? 
Yeah, so when they, they um, do get an out-of-school suspension, the first thing they always ask them if they do have internet service at home. Um, and uh, if they don't, then we set them up with a hotspot. Uh, and if they do, um, then that's great too. But the one thing that we always communicate with them is that their teachers will reach out to them via Google Classroom, which is um, we use predominantly at the middle school, or, and or email. Uh, and then, of course, they always have the opportunity to email their teachers with any questions as well, too. So. And um, I actually would like to talk about suspension more in depth in a future um, workshop. But um, as we're seeing here with the data, the more the more students are gone, the more poorly they generally do, the more they fail, the more they're disconnected. There's lots of data um, that we have gleaned from going to, at least I have gleaned from going to the MSBA conferences. We want to keep students engaged um, to learn, to have those supports. You know, a kid might have internet at home, but what else is going on at home? There are just so many things, and if we want to support our students and keep them engaged and learning, um, I'm not a fan of out-of-school suspensions. And so I would kind of like to know the process, and maybe we don't want to get into all that tonight, but what causes a student to not have in-school suspension but get moved into out-of-school suspension and therefore miss attendance? Sure. I can tell you kind of in a brief nutshell here, like at Southwest, for example, what's the difference between the two? So really it comes down to uh, the safety of other students. So if it's a physical fight, it's out of school suspension. And again, the reasoning behind that is because of the safety of all of our students there. Um, the other ones that are for sure out of school suspensions are like a, um, a drug or a tobacco um, violation would be a out of school suspension as well. And again, it's not like, Ms. Larson or I are sitting behind the desk thinking of ways to remove students from school because we understand too um, that being in school is important as well. Um, but when we're looking at the I don't know, 490 other students too that deserve that um, education, it, uh, that's kind of what bases our decision on that. But when they're in school suspension, they're not out in the n normal general population, are they? They're confined in the <laughs> administrative office. Yep. So if a person, and this is how it used to be, maybe it's different. Years ago, when two students were in a fight, it didn't matter who was at wrong, who started it. Both students were in trouble. Is that still... Yeah, it takes two to tango, essentially. So if uh, one student strikes another one, the other student strikes the other one back, then both students are out of school. Fault. Yes. They're out of school for how long? Uh, anywhere from three to five days, just that's, depends. That's a lot of school to miss, and that is where my whole foundation of this questioning is, because sure. to, from my opinion, as an independent <laughs> board member, um, I would like to see us do what we could to keep these students in school engaged. Um, especially when they're going to be in, they're not going to be out in the general public creating more safety hazards. They're in a supervised, they should be in a supervised um, area. So why can't we make that happen? Sure. And it ultimately, a lot of it comes down to space and supervision, essentially. So in, for example, for Southwest, we do have four ISS rooms, which isn't a problem with supervising or anything like that. But if we were to ever have more than four students that had in-school suspension at one time, we just don't have necessarily the space or supervision to watch those students. How many students do you have on average in, in school suspension yeah, yeah. at I a mean, time? very rarely are you going to have that many at that time. But So based on the data that you gave us, Ron, um, my math shows that it was 10 out of school suspensions for a year, right? In the data that you gave us? I'd have to pull which data. So the, 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 the data that you gave us, it said board uh, uh, suspension rates, and it high, has ISS or OSS, and I just took 7th and 8th grade. So I see, how many students did you say you have 500? 500, but it would be just 6th and 7th grade at Southwest. Right, 6th and 7th. I'm sorry, I said yeah. it wrong. The, but it's, it's a total of 23 suspensions is what I count, Okay. and 10 of those are out of school. I guess my point is, I think about the other 490 students that we're serving. Um, I don't. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it if it's not a problem. You know, I don't. 
that's where I'm at about sure. it. So. So I just want to reinforce, and, and we know that um, there is a lot of work to do. And when a, a student is at home, how are we supporting the student? There's research to show that suspension is not going to change your behavior, but you have to think about educating the whole child and supporting the child. And as we think moving forward, how do we implement restorative practices? How do we support each student? And going back to the Hawthorne and the Sabres piece, how do we recognize some opportunities to support a student through their engagement? So attendance is absolutely essential. When we get a student to school, how are we supporting the student, not only in their learning, but their social emotional learning and their engagement and potentially any other uh, external variables that may be impacting. So it is supporting the whole child. And what you're hearing from Principal Johnson is that triangulation of data. It's not just necessarily about the academics, but it's the attendance. It's about the engagement. It's about the, uh, the learning. So all those different pieces to support the individual learning plan of each, each child. And if a child then uh, goes, or one of our scholars then goes against a handbook or needs a, some sort of a learning opportunity or a, results in a suspension, how are we supporting the student and what is that? Then when they come back, that intake, what does that look like to help support the student? So it is a learning process and there is a lot of work that we need to continue to do and we fully recognize that. Thank you, and I'll just make one last comment, and then I'll let that that issue go. But um, we all, I think we all know that the more we can help one student, the more it does help the culture in the whole school, and it does help the safety and well-being of everyone. And so it is important, as we're saying, to focus on each student, and it's not at the it's not at the cost of other students. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right. Uh, moving on uh, to our student proficiency. So here is our MCA data. Uh, and so because we are only sixth and seventh grade, we do not test science. Science is in fifth grade, and then they'll take it again in eighth grade. So uh, the green here is reading, and then the blue is our math scores. So um, it goes from 2018, and then each dot is a year. Uh, of course, 2020 is when COVID happened, so there was no testing. Uh, the far right is our scores from last year, and we'll go in a little bit more in depth on these scores as well, but just to kind of give you a visual of over time. All right, so our left uh, table here shows us our math scores from last year. Uh, this um, MCA diagram on the right shows our reading scores from last year as well. And so, uh, as you can see, uh, we had about 120 students meet or exceed the math standards last year, which puts us uh, just about 27, 28 uh, percent. So again, uh, definitely room for improvement here. Uh, then reading, uh, looking at our numbers from last year, just about 180-ish students met or exceeded the standards in reading, um, which is about 40, 41 percent as well. So. Um, Again, um, definitely areas for growth, but this is where we are currently at. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Does anyone ever, um, or can this data be um, be um, parsed out so that we could see um, perf um, proficiency and and does not meet by attendance? That's a good question. Um, I don't think MDE would give any of that data, but I mean, that could be something where we could look into. We could certainly disaggregate that by looking at correlate the attendance with the proficiency. Uh, again, the research does show that, you know, it, attendance is one piece. Uh, specifically, uh, our students of color, getting them to s school by attendance does not necessarily uh, result in their, their learning uh, trajectory. So once we get into school, what is that going back to multi-tiered system support? What is that individual plan for each student? So you cross crosswalk the two, they're absolutely important. And that's the uh, reason that, you know, the triangulation that Principal Johnson is showing of the data to show the correlation of the two, but we can disaggregate that as well. And, and I'd like to just throw in, for the sake of the argument that um, it would appear that uh, when you look at the data, people with poor attendance have bad grades. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the poor attendance that's causing the bad grades. I mean, that in logical fallacies, that's referred to as a post hoc argument. I think the problem is greater because we have a problem with attendance and we have a problem with poor grades. If you could cure the attendance, and I don't know how we do that, but if we could cure the attendance, then the prob the deeper problem that causes poor attendance, which also causes bad grades, would resolve for itself. We have better grades, but but how you how you uh, magically convince students to attend not just physically but attend mentally. Uh, boy, I wish we could uh, wave a magic wand and pull that one off. Yeah, and Chair Squirrel, too, I mean, like, on top of that as well, you know, like, with our behavior issues as well, m most of the time, I'm not going to say every time, but there's that ancestral trauma where, you know, like, a lot of times that student has experienced some sort of trauma, and if you dive deeper in, you can see that their parents have experienced some type of trauma as well um, to where, again, trying to break that cycle is challenging, but... Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, and then uh, this one is just showing our participation uh, at Southwest of the MCAs over the last five years-ish as well. And so this is another area for growth that I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So just to kind of, so you can kind of understand what you're looking at, you can see that 2018, 2019, I don't know the exact numbers, but just under 100% of our kiddos took the MCAs, uh, where last year we had 87% of the students take the MCAs. All right, uh, so this is our FAST data, and again, uh, a little bit different than what Mr. Mahal just showed you as well, but this is this year's FAST reading scores. And so just to kind of put it in perspective, and I know they're not the exact same thing, but to help make more sense for you guys, uh, the orange or the reddish orange color, if you want to talk about like MCAs, this would be kind of like that area where the students meet, or sorry, exceed the standards. Uh, that area in orange or the yellow orange would be like meeting the standards. The area in green would be um, partially meets the standards, and then the blue would be does not meet. And it's not exactly the same thing, but you can kind of think of it that way. Because um, as you can see, the green covers a wide range of students. Basically, the students that fall between 30 and 85 percentile um, get put into that category. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide range. That's why we tend to see more students in that area. So is this another representation of what the elementaries have showed us in that pink, purple kind of graphing they've done? Yeah, uh, in, in, a, in a different way, essentially. So the, the reason why there's nothing above the W and S is just because that's the winter and spring scores, which we obviously haven't done yet. So this is just the fall scores from this year's data. And to put it in perspective, last spring, the orange and the red areas um, added up to 53%. So just like Mr. Mahal was talking about with the Sabres, we hope to see that those scores increase as we go through the winter and springtime as well. So same data here with the math um, scores as well. Uh, so this is both sixth and seventh grade. Uh, same setup as well as far as what you're looking at as far as the percentages and the colors that go with that. All right, so time to move on to some celebrations. Uh, gym floor is almost finished. In fact, well, it's technically finished now. We're just waiting for it to dry right now. So the, the plan is by next Monday to start having PE classes back in there. Uh, and we'll talk about this as well. But we're going to have an all-school assembly that Friday uh, as well. So um, again, uh, kudos to our PE teachers, uh, Mr. Boat, Ms. Bauer, and Ms. Steele, uh, and the weather uh, as well for being so cooperative this year. We've been pretty lucky uh, to be able to have outside PE in November. So, 
I, I believe I've asked this question before, and I think it, it was answered, but I've, I've witnessed two of these uh, floods, <laughs> these biblical floods uh, that ha have invaded southwest gymnasium. Uh, have we, I, I'm, I, I, think, I hope I know the answer to this question, have we done something to assure that barring another biblical flood, yeah. this will never happen again? I mean, a minor biblical flood is what we've had. Uh, are, are we protected against that? Yes, and uh, from what I understand, the, the, the this summer was a little bit different from the one that happened uh, like eight years ago. Um, but the the issue from this summer has been resolved as well. So, hopefully. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one we've uh, both our sixth and seventh grade. Uh, classes have been able to go on uh, field trips, so our seventh graders went to the rendezvous. Uh, that was a great experience for them. Uh, and our sixth graders went to the Minnesota uh, History Museum uh, right before MEA as well. And again, it was a great experience for them uh, to explore. And in sixth grade, they have that Minnesota history class, so to be able to tie in what they're learning and what they're going to be learning uh, to uh, what they were able to see at the museum was great. Our why try, so these are our SEL lessons, so our uh, counselor, resource specialist, and social worker um, did training this uh, summer on the why try. And again, it's just a program to uh, encourage social emotional learning. Uh, the big thing with the why try program is that they use metaphors to help kind of relate issues going on in students' lives as well. So these are the three metaphors that they've um, talked about so far. And how it works is that our counselor, social worker, and resource specialist um, we'll go into an advisory plus room to teach the lesson. Uh, they get these lessons taught once every two weeks, and then on the week where they don't go into the classroom, there's a follow-up lesson from the previous teaching of that lesson as well. Uh, another new thing this year is uh, we've instilled team competitions. So uh, as you guys are all well aware, is that our sixth grade is divided into the blue and the red team. Uh, our seventh grade is divided into the Bengal and Siberian team. Uh, and this is really another uh, avenue to help encourage positive behavior, positive choices within the school. Uh, and so teams earn points through a number of different things. So uh, each month we do like team challenges. So again, since we didn't have the gymnasium, we weren't able to do the school-wide. Um, but during our lunchtime, uh, during the October team relays, uh, we had students compete in different activities. Uh, and depending on how they did, they earned um, certain points for their team. Uh, teams also earn points by the fewest number of tardies given out, um, the fewest number of incidences in synergy, and then uh, the number of A's and B's per student given out as well will also give their team points. And then at the end of the quarter, which um, we're going to do this next Friday, uh, we will have a celebration where uh, we do drawings um, with the winning team getting more draws than the second place team, so forth and so on, uh, to get prizes to reward the awesome things that we see at Southwest. Uh, another celebration uh, is the instructional model uh, that we've selected to use here at Elberly Schools and then our CT work. So our teachers meet every Wednesday for their CT work district wide. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna be selfish and say that I've been blessed with a very awesome instructional coach with Wendy Greenfield. Her and I meet and uh, she's been doing some great things as well within our CTs. So uh, bi-weekly they'll meet. Um, and what we're looking at here is the instructional model. So essentially there's 43 elements uh, within our instructional model. Uh, we at Southwest have focused on or selected 13 of these elements to focus on this year. Uh, and not to say that the other ones aren't important and that they're not being used in the classroom, but really we decided on 13 elements, and that's the one with the little snippet of the white paper there, uh, to focus in on. And so every other week, um, Wendy Greenfield will um, talk a little bit more in depth on our, those two elements, uh, and the staff can kind of work together uh, to learn more about those as well. Uh, what I do in my walkthroughs then is when I go through a classroom, um, I'll use something similar to that white piece of paper there on the screen uh, and then highlight the elements that I see and then provide some feedback to the staff and then that gets put into their mailbox as well. Can I ask if you could send these to us because they're not coming through in a, in a readable manner oh, yes, for yes, us? Yes. Thanks. Yep. 
Uh, and so I, Part of that too is the instructional rounds, and again, Ms. Greenfield, our instructional coach, uh, organizes all of this as well. And uh, we were just in a meeting with Phil Warwick, who's um, kind of our guru when it comes to the HRS work. And uh, he, he's said multiple times that you know if you were to only do one thing to improve teacher instruction, it's to do instructional rounds. Uh, and so essentially, what an instructional round is is the instructional coach takes two to three teachers with them, and they basically stop into a classroom. Um, for five to 15 minutes, observe it, and then they'll go into another classroom, do the same thing, and then they all meet and kind of go over what they saw, things that worked well, uh, and then the teacher, what we call the host teacher, gets a follow-up email with the positives that they, um, what was observed in their classrooms. So you can see here, we did two instructional rounds in October. Um, we had 11 different host teachers, which is awesome uh, to have. Uh, and this is all voluntary as well. And then we had 13 different teachers um, participate in those two instructional rounds for a total of six periods observed. Uh, and another one, our student council. Uh, so Ms. Beeson and Ms. Wongen are our student, uh, student council advisories. Uh, they've been doing an awesome job with our student council. The picture on the left there is from our Albert Lee leadership group uh, that came by with the Education Day la uh, last time. And so our student council members met them, kind of talked about Southwest, uh, things that they do, answered any questions. Uh, and everybody in that group was just amazed by how well um, those student council members um, were and how they were able to talk about Southwest. So kudos to them. Uh, today and tomorrow, they're also helping run our student mock elections. So that's run through the Secretary of State um, and it gives the students this kind of a real life example of how elections work. So um, again, they're doing an awesome job. Uh, I'm starting to meet with them once a month uh, to kind of give them more leadership opportunities within the school as well. And so one thing that you'll see here too is that we do a weekly video announcement series called the Tiger Talk, and it's just viewed every Monday uh, during advisory. Uh, but I want them to have a segment in there as well to be able to talk about just different things going on um, within their lives. Um, as well. And so they'll also be part of the poster updates uh, throughout our school to give them a little bit more buy-in as well. All right, other celebrations. So our ADSYS, that's our intervention uh, support. Uh, and this is a page right off of uh, Ms. Frank's playbook uh, when she, I was talking with her this summer and their win groups about how they organize them by their needs. Uh, what we did with the ADSYS group uh, more so for reading than our math, but group them based on their needs. So the, the five kiddos that needed help with phonics, they're in the first hour reading ADSYS class. The five students that needed help with comprehension, well, they're in the third hour ADSYS reading class. So that way they're getting the support that they need. Um, other celebrations are resource specialists that we have. Uh, Ms. Kirsch, she does outstanding work as well. Um, she comes with a counseling background and intervention background as well. Uh, and so she's been doing an awesome job pulling students that need help with either reading and or math as well. Uh, homework help, so this is new this year as well, um, but this is an opportunity for students to uh, come in in the morning and get help. We have two teachers in the homework help room, and then also Ms. Kirsch has uh, done some peer tutoring as well, so some of our um, students will go in during the mornings and offer support to the students. How do the students get to school early or are they already there if they're being bused? Yeah, so it just depends. I, you know, when I get there usually at seven, there's sometimes our students already waiting outside. Um, so it just varies. Uh, the, if it's not below zero or if it's not rain, uh, we open the doors at 755. And again, it just comes down to the, super, the supervision piece of it. Uh, so at 755, the doors open, students can come in to homework help, they can walk the block, get breakfast and all of that other stuff as well. Um, but before then, unless it's below zero or raining, um, they just wait outside. And then what time is your first class? Uh, the day starts at 8.30. I'm oh. oh, sorry, because I was just, I had a thought when um, Chair Score was saying earlier about um, you know, succeeding in, in class and failings and things because uh, you know, the, the data we've seen are MCAs and that's not really reflecting how many fails um, the students have. And I just know personally from working <laughs> with this age group and probably through high school 
that um, the fails are mostly f because of stuff not turned in. And so um, that's kind of a different, whole different animal than the MCA um, data, I think, because, you know, an attendance comes into both of those, but um, if, if students aren't hearing um, the classes at all, you know, uh, they're, they're not going to do as well on a test. But when it comes to actually failing classes, um, do you find that as well, that it's mostly because of missing assignments? Not necessarily at Southwest, just because of how the grading policy is set up there. So uh, any student at Southwest, 90% of their grade comes from assessment and 10% comes from homework or uh, practice as well. Um, but essentially the, the homework is practice to get them ready for the assessment as well. And so like I always use the sports analogy where you just don't show up for a football game on a Friday night. It's the practice that leads up to that and depending on how well you practice is how well you participate in that game. So um, it's the same thing. And that's part on us as educators to make sure that we are assigning purposeful homework and then two, making sure that we follow up with students to do that. So th there's already been conversations with students that maybe are lagging behind with them and their families like, hey, we have homework help offered um, in the mornings, and then so they jumped at that and um, gotten that support as well. How long has it been that that change of philosophy has been, um, or the grading policy has been mostly based on assessments? How long? Uh, since I've been there at least. Wow, okay. Yeah. really, okay. Oh, oh and um, is it possible to get some failing data too? As far as like this last quarter? Uh, or, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, Thank absolutely. <laughs> All right, so opportunities for growth. Again, uh, obviously this, our MCA scores that we want to uh, increase as well. Uh, the other piece of this too, um, and you're going to see this uh, it's kind of, I don't know, a trend maybe if you want to say that, uh, but we had 67 families and students uh, that opted out of the MCAs. Uh, and again, that's their right. They, I mean, that's their option if they want to do that. The problem is, is that it counts as a um, does not meet the standards on our end of things. Uh, and so, you know, those 67 students, and I'm not going to say that they're all high flyers or low achievers. I mean, like, there's just 67 students that um, had opted out. So whether they were going to pass or not, it doesn't matter because they count as a does not meet the standards when it's all said and done. So. Communicating that out with families just to make sure that they understand that when they do opt out of the test that this is part of that dilemma that we face. Um, and again, just making sure and trying to break that barrier of, I don't know, the negative stigma that they might associate with the MCAs as well. And do you know what the state average opt out is? I don't know what that state average is. So um, I don't know if that's a state average there, if that's... Oh yeah, it's, it's on, it doesn't have the actual percentages, but like the dark bar on that graph is the state average, and then the light blue is Southwest Middle School. So if I had to guess, it looks like the state average would be about 90%-ish last year. Oh, and I meant for opting out. Yeah, that's what I mean, sorry. Oh, so that is the opt out, yep. gotcha. And, okay, thank you. Uh, another area for growth here uh, is our parent engagement night. So this is something that we started or tried last spring. Uh, it was when we were starting to see a little bit more influx in our social media between students and issues that we were seeing. Uh, and so uh, we hosted a parent engagement night uh, last spring, and it just happened to be like the first really nice night of spring as well. Uh, so we had, I think, five families show up for that. Um, so this year what we try to do is to base it around conferences. We got this on the calendar before the start of the year as well. And so, uh, you know, obviously the first one was our open house. And so that was when I talked kind of about the basics, a little bit about social media. Um, Paul Durban was actually there too to talk a little bit about the activities that offered at Southwest. And I didn't keep a, a, the actual number, but that's why I put 50-ish. Um, we offered that four different times during that day uh, for families to come in and kind of learn more about Southwest and ask questions. Uh, in September and October, so those dates were our fall conferences as well, uh, and those were at 6 p.m. in the Little Theater. You can see the topic, first one was on sexting, and the other one was navigating the digital seas. Uh, the second role there talks about which people were from the community there were to talk, and then our attendance for that night as well. So obviously, um, 
got to get creative with how we do these just because I do think they are valuable. Uh, they are things that we do see with our students and a lot of times when we do have a conversation with a family member, um, sometimes we hear the, I just don't get it, you know, the technology piece, so, yeah, I'm not sure about that. So trying to find ways to help educate our families and parents as well. Uh, so in uh, February, uh, we're planning on doing a vaping um, presentation and you know that could lead into you know our ATOT or alcohol tobacco other drugs as well um, but again try to be creative with how we can reach more families uh, then in May uh, again you can see this is one of my growth areas or our growth areas at Southwest is to increase students and in activities uh, so one thing I thought about is you know in the in the May as we go into summer communicating that out with our sixth grade families especially because as they enter into seventh grade now they're part of the Minnesota State High School League um, but just making sure they understand that the physicals and how to register and things like that as well. All right, so uh, last slide here uh, is again another more oppor it, more opportunities for growth, uh, getting students involved in activities. Uh, one thing that stood out to me last year when I was at the truancy meeting at the courthouse, uh, so uh, Judge Looney was there, the deans were there, uh, Sergeant Strom from the police department was there, and it's more of an informational session, to talking to parents about uh, truancy um, as well. But one of the concerns that uh, some parents vocalize is that there's just not enough outside of school activities for their students to do. Uh, you know, and part of me thinking as well is that, you know, we offer a wide variety of activities here at Albert Lee uh, and, you know, just to get those students tapped into something new, especially with your guys' work and Mrs. Mr. Durban's work on uh, the activity fee structure, uh, because we, as you guys all know, we all know that when students are involved in extracurricular activities, they tend to do better educationally and they learn a lot of good life skills along the way. Uh, also looking to hire uh, a social worker, and then I, I know everything always comes down to funding, uh, but uh, our counselor and resource specialists have been doing an outstanding job at Southwest, so um, looking at keeping them, and they're part of that ESSER fund as well. Uh, the additional school resource officer, I know Officer Khan is busy uh, uh, at the high school as well, and not necessarily um, for the consequence side, the additional school resource officer, but I think of just the educational piece that we could hit on so much with our middle school and then also even the elementary buildings as well um, to help our students along the way as well, So, which hopefully would reduce the number of incidences too as they get older and advance through school. Um, and if a student is on out-of-school suspension, are they able to participate in activities? Uh, yeah, good question. So no, they are not. Um, when they are out of school suspended or even in school suspended as well, um, that then they are no longer allowed on school property during that suspension time. Yeah. And years ago we did have a resource officer at um, Southwest, and so you would definitely see the value in that. All right, any other questions for me at this time? Yeah, I just want to thank Principal Johnson and his staff. Uh, it's been a a learning opportunity this uh, this fall from August to now with uh, without the the gym and they've persevered through that and it's uh, compliments to his staff it's you know that the weather has held out but it's also anytime you change and using that word in all caps uh, for anyone but specifically our middle school scholars uh, it, it does disrupt some of their their routines but uh, the, the students have been amazing at Southwest and they've continued to move forward so my compliments to you and your staff and also not only did he not have a gym and a major flood but as a new dad you know Principal Johnson was uh, definitely balancing a few things so again my compliments to you all and in the hopes we've mitigated any type of flooding uh, that's definitely not the way that a new superintendent wants to come in with with multiple uh, water issues but but know that um, leadership matters and I appreciate Principal Johnson and his team for the work that you've been doing. Oh, so one final question. If there was one thing that um, the community as a whole or our elementaries could do 
to prepare Southwest students for success, what could that be? Yeah, you know, uh, one thing that we see, and again, not pointing the finger at any one thing, because I think it's a much more systematic thing, is uh, our students, just their writing ability uh, is gone down now. Again, maybe because of the pandemic, is it because of social media, is it because you know we're all texting now and um, all of that, but uh, I would say that our writing um, is something that um, we can definitely work on, and if we could improve that, um, I think that we would see some great growth as well. As a former English teacher, I can second that, and I think you hit perhaps pretty close to the head with the texting thing and the new language that's been introduced on our population, student population, <laughs> as a result of social media. It's not exactly consistent with, with good writing techniques. Anything else? Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, guys. All right, finally, district goals, ensure high quality core instruction, focusing on tier one of multi-tiered systems of support and strength, strengthen the professional learning communities and data cycles, world's best workforce, Gail and Mary Jo. Thank you. Um, okay, world's best workforce. Again, this is the annual report that we present to the school board. And before it came here, it's been a work in progress in buildings, the strategies that we're using, as well as it went to district curriculum. A couple school board members sit on that committee and were there. Um, you know, the district curriculum committee is a broad range of people from across the community, uh, board members, community members, city of Albert Lee employees, county employees, retired teachers, current staff, Gail and I. And so since that meeting, we've heard feedback from um, you know, city staff on some more strategies, ideas, as well as uh, county with Lana Howe. So just know the world's best workforce, this is the annual report. It came into legislation in 2013 that school districts do this. I think it's important to know that in Albert Lee, we dive even deeper than the world's best workforce. And today was an example of your seeing much more detail in buildings. Um, and so this really is an overview. You're, you're seeing great things um, and great work that the buildings are doing. So this tonight is just an overview of what the goals were, where we reached, and then just setting SMART goals for uh, the rest of this year. So Gail and I are um, just presenting that tonight. And jump in if I miss anything. Okay. So again, these are the five areas from the Minnesota Department of Ed on world's best workforce goals. They don't change. These have been this, the same since 2013. So the first goal is, of course, all children ready for school. And so the goal um, is to increase that when we do the fast testing, which you've heard a lot about from our elementary principals, is the target was 50%. Well, how do we get that target for the 22-23 school year? It's by um, really um, working with families before students get to kindergarten, getting them in the early, you know, any early childhood program, preschooling, et cetera. Um, because the, the one thing we know that the, the word gap is a man, a tremendous. So by age three, they call it the 30 million word gap. If um, it, it, how do we say this? From our wealthiest to our poorest families, there is a 30 million word gap by age three. So when you hear the, the data that's been out there for years, um, we work very hard to make families um, understand we have great programs, there's great programs in the community, and getting kids opportunity before they arrive uh, in kindergarten. So that's th when we fast tested the students as they came to kindergarten this year uh, for their reading assessment, 41% are considered on track. The goal, you know, we, a SMART goal was set for this year is 50%. Um, and then looking forward, the reason for that 46%, Gail and I were talking about this, is we set these goals 
um, to get an achievement and integration grant. Never mind, we set this goal based for next year based on 41%, we increased it by 5%. Say in next year, we'd like next year's incoming kindergartners uh, to have 46% being on target. In reality, we'd love to tell you, we would love 100% of our kids on track ready for kindergarten. But we have to set smart, attainable goals, and so 5% is um, very common of if we put the correct plan, systems, strategies in place, we can increase that goal for next year. Oops. Any questions on that? Um, you know, that's when we're going to community centers, churches, the public library, any way we can, getting the word out to families that early learning is important because that brain development at that point is, is the, the biggest growth as any of us have, will ever have in our life is that birth to three. So how do we make sure those students who are birth to three are having that tremendous growth that's needed? Well, it's by doing us as educators getting the word out. And so any way we can, um, that's, that is in our control to do that. And I think, you know, as we brought it forward to the district curriculum committee last month and discussed this, you know, one of the things is the city people and the county people there, they're seeing a lot of families as well. So that's what we're talking back and forth of how do they continue to get the word out? Because they are getting the word out. But are there other avenues we, need, we haven't thought about? So it's really that brainstorming with all community partners to make sure that we're doing what's best for families. And what pre-K programs is the district currently involved with? Like early childhood programming. Um, it's birth to five, so there's quite a gamut. I mean. Yeah, Chair, and, and thank you, Mary, to just to reinforce, and, and you've heard the language that birth to adult, when you start thinking about the planning and the visioning out, I think that's the importance piece as we look at our voluntary pre-K or pre-K program here, but how do we look to expand, and we can work with the legislature on the funding for that, but also what are we doing internally, and what is that scale of, of opportunity that we have beyond the students that attend our, our pre-K programs, and that's where you really look at, at and extend that out beyond the students that are attending and how are we working out in the community. So that will be the future visioning of that birth to adult. Do you have any um, sense of how, how many of the incoming kindergartners have been involved with pre-K in any fashion? We do track. So when uh, families come in to register their, their kindergarten student, we do ask, has, have you, actually would you tell us as well, but been involved with any preschool programming. And we have seen that number go up. Um, you know, we didn't finalize that data before tonight's meeting, so I will get that to you. As, as we're getting ready, it's like, oh yeah, we do have that data. So um, we will email that out to you, so you do have that. The second goal is that all, read, all third graders can read at grade level. And so the actual from, and again, this is based on the MCAs from last spring, our target was 48%, actual was 42%. I think you got more details from each building, hearing um, the challenges and opportunities. But, um, you know, again, we set a SMART goal for next year to increase that. And you saw that from the buildings as well, that we have a lot of work to do. We know that. Um, and I think they, they, you know, the principal shared some of the strategies of what we're doing, our MTSS model of really diving in and what does each individual student need to make them successful. 
Goal three is uh, closing the achievement gap among all student groups. So this is a number that we want to see decrease. So there's a lot of um, numbers on this page, but where it's highlighted, uh, like the first one, Hispanic, Hispanic Latino, the uh, decrease went down. I don't know, Gail, help me out with okay. this. We, we kept, <laughs> even as we talk about it, we have to think about this. But the decrease went down from the prior year of the gap between white students to Hispanic Latino. So 20, 2021, the gap was 23%. Last year, 2022, it's 22%. And then same for uh, Asian and black students. Am I missing anything on that? No, that we there's, talked a about? Lot of num there's a lot of numbers on there, so we just tried to highlight the ones where the decrease was happening, which, which is what we want to happen. But actually, there was an increase, right, in, in the black African American, but the actual number is down. What? Okay, 2022. Mm -hmm. The left side is for math, and then the right oh. side is reading. I wonder if you're looking oh, at. Oh, I didn't explain that. Yet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, it's just a lot of data on this goal. So. Okay. So goal four is all students are ready for career and college. So this goal is based on ACT scores. And our goal for this last school year dissected the ACT into the different subjects, English, math, reading, and science. And again, we highlighted where we met our targets on the right. So that was in mathematics and reading. We did meet those goals. Uh, we had input from a lot of uh, principals and leadership across the district for creating goals for this coming year. And we got feedback from Principal Dibble at the high school that their building goal is on a composite score. So if you look at this screen, you can see that we're simple, well, I don't know if the goal's simple, but it's easier to read, I guess, because we wanted to align with what the high school is working on, and they are working on increasing the percent of Albert Lee students achieving that composite score of 23 and above. And the target score is more than a 5% gain, but um, that is what the high school is working on, so we aligned it with what they are working on. Is that 23 established because of there's connection to success after high school, or is that just a? That comes from ACT, that okay. you're on track if you score 23 or above. Okay. And then goal five is uh, graduation, and it's based on the four-year graduation rate. And just a reminder, I mean, students can, if they don't graduate in the four years, they can continue on through seven years of high school. Um, MDE sets the target at 85%. And um, so you can see we, we met it in um, just the Asian category. But, so it's broken out in demographics. We still track it in our own graduation, but MDE uses the, as, as a statewide view, uses a four-year. Yes, and I don't have it in front of me, but I know when we've looked at our five-year graduation and six-year graduation, we have been above the state average in those numbers because we really do push kids, continue on, don't, you know, and they can choose high school, ALC, it's still school choice. 
Do you have any understanding of why the Hispanic Latino dropped so greatly? I don't, but Chris is presenting next time, so Chris maybe add that as we dive into data at the high school. Just to give you some context of uh, focusing on the individual student, I was meeting with Principal Thomas from the ALC today, and a student that is missing uh, two cre credits that's uh, Latino that um, is still working as kind of the um, caregiver for the family, but she's two credits short. So she's really working, how do we get this student back to support them to get those two credits, while also balancing trying to care for the family. So that's an individual so, but that, if you, if you take that and look holistically, that is the work we have to do to support our students and our families. This data actually is one year back as well because we don't get the official graduation data until March. So you'll see that the data we're looking at for in the blue, the target, that's all from 2021 students. And it is a little, it's, it is a little challenging to compare the 2020 data with the 2021 data because 2020, the directive really from MDE was do not fail students. COVID had just hit in March, have them finish the year. And so we did that. 2020, or yeah, 2021, um, you know, it, it's, back to the traditional really meeting expectations. So that if you compare those two years, that's a little explanation on that. So that would mean that in 2020, this amount of students was already not gonna graduate before that last semester. If they all got their last semester passed, then they would have already been at this point then after the first semester of senior year. I'm not sure I followed that, Joe. And I don't know. I guess I'm, I guess I'm trying to see what that means to me too, but I guess it means that they're, they weren't on track to graduate. That, that, that percentage was not on track to graduate um, that year. Prior, prior to COVID? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying, yes, okay. And that's uh, some work we're also we're looking into with Principal Dillon and his team to have an on-track system to where we start looking at the students as they enter into high school and how are we monitoring uh, the successes and opportunities of students as they navigate the high school and their credits and as well as multiple data points in that on-track system. Okay, and the last piece that goes with today's presentation and this is uh, a little quicker, so is the achievement and integration just updates on that. The achievement and integration program is a three-year plan. It needs to be presented with the world's best workforce. Um, as well and, and approved as part of the board tonight and sent to MD by December 15th. But we are in our third year of the achievement and integration program. Again, most of our funding goes to support our bilingual services of success coaches and really looking at any opportunities we can provide kids um, who may need more support. And this winter we will start writing as a district another, our, our next three-year plan for the achievement and integration which would start next year. So over the three years the first one was goal one was just increasing um, the dec decreasing the gap thank you between our free and reduced and non-free and reduced population and so the actual last year, um, we did decrease from the prior year, and our target this spring is to continue to have that gap go down. Second goal is, as we talk about cu cultural competency and understanding all 
all of the students and families we serve. We continue to do trainings. Our success coaches continue, continue to provide in-house trainings and just really making sure that we understand all the students and families we serve, you know, culturally to make sure that we're serving everybody uh, well in our education system. And then the last goal is the number of students enrolled in our um, CIS AP classes um, will increase of our non-white students. And so our goal has been. So this was that was the beginning. Really thank you. Slide. Yeah. Um, again, we set this as a three-year goal three years ago, but Gail, help me through yeah. this. <laughs> so we had to set our targets three years ago. So we actually last year surpassed our target that we had set for the third year. So we um, started with 8%. Um, got 10% last year, but that's why you see our target is lower um, for the 22-23 year because it was set previously. Did we explain that okay? You did great. Okay, okay. Uh, one thing that occurs to me is that our percentages might naturally go up because we are gradually achieving a higher percentage of non-white students, mm -hmm. period. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So, thank you, Gail. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the presentation for tonight. Any other questions? One question, I know we're all tired, so, but I did promise a parent I talked to yesterday that I'd ask this. She had said that prior to the pandemic, there were targeted services available after, this, after school to give extra support in math and reading. Um, and she'd said to stop during COVID. Um, just wondering, are we doing anything similar restarting programs like that? What are we doing? Yeah, so families are signing up at conferences. Um, our, our I'm going to say our challenge right now is staffing. So we're working on hiring teachers to fill the slot. Um, and so at conferences, families are being talked about targeted services. We just don't have all the slots filled in all the buildings. So yes, it's a work in progress. Which we are calling Tiger Tales. And we did offer Target it this summer, um, K, K7 or 1-7, um, and great turnout, offered lots of experiential ed opportunities as well. And so we'd obviously like to do that again, but um, staffing is our challenge. Thank you. When, when's our next meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Did you say 7 a.m.? 7 a.m. And I actually have a comment and a request if I could. Thank you. So I will not be present at the canvassing meeting. Um, last year I was also not present during the canvassing meeting and during the following closed session for labor negotiations, which is now public record, materials were presented and I became the subject of discussion. Um, this discussion was brought against me without my knowledge or my notification after the fact either. And uh, this is the very meeting which I requested to listen to and was stonewalled after the fact. Um, then Chair Clot allowed the discussion and Member Nelson called for repercussions. So I request this type of behavior not happen this year when I'm not there. And I know you weren't there either. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Noted. Um, so uh, our next regular meeting will be uh, Monday, November 21st at uh, the usual time, 5 p.m. Okay. Meeting is adjourned.